Father God, thank you for your presence with us as we have worshipped this morning, as we have uh, prayed together, as we prayed for each other. Uh, Thank you. Thank you that you continue to be present with us now as we begin together to look at your word. Father God, I ask that you will speak to us this morning as I often pray. I don't just want us to gain information, but actually want to gain some revelation from yourself. Father, as we look at uh, this passage this morning, I ask for each of us when we leave here or when we finish watching this on the internet that you will have spoken to us. We will have heard your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're continuing this morning with the series that I've been doing, looking at the book of Ecclesiastes. So uh, if uh, you're not sure where Ecclesiastes is, I recommend the index. It's uh, an excellent way of finding some of the smaller books, particularly in the Old Testament. So the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a It's a part of the Old Testament that, as I've said a number of times, that Christians don't often look at. It's regarded by some people as being one of the strangest books in the Bible. Uh, But it happens to be a book I enjoy reading. It's a book that asks really tough, difficult questions about life. Questions that a lot of people prefer not to look at. But Ecclesiastes asks those questions. It uh, undermines confidence in and trust in human wisdom. It undermines confidence and trust in money and possessions, in human pleasure, or in human justice. Its themes include looking at how frail and fragile human life actually is. And how important it is, therefore, to to seize the day. It's really relevant in this season of life because it questions many of the assumptions and the values of the cultures that we live in today. So if you want more about the background to the book on our website, you'll find the whole of the series on Ecclesiastes. And in the first part of that series, you will find uh, me talking about, in the very first one, the background and the origin of the book and, and some of the other things about it, which I'm not going to repeat this morning. So we're, about, we're going to get halfway through the book today. Oh, a bit of appreciation. Going to get halfway through the book today. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a question in a moment about if you can think back about some of the things that you've learned so far. If you're a visitor here or you're here with us for the first time, I should explain that that when I am teaching, I ask questions. Some, Some preachers ask questions and then tell you the answer. I ask questions and you tell me the answer. Does that seem good? Timmy, I think you've worn them out this morning with all that worship. So they're not very responsive. So I, I just, I, can, can, you, can you just help? Can you stand up, please? Can you just help the congregation here? So I asked them the question about, is it good that when I ask them questions and, you know, uh, uh, and I expected like a, like a yes answer. So I'm going to ask them the question again. And can you help them sort of uh, just, just to encourage me by saying yes in a, in a positive way? Can, we, can, can, you, can you help me with that? Okay. Thank you. So anyway, when I'm preaching, I, uh, as I go through, I ask questions and I, I look for your help and response. Is that a good thing? Yes! Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Timmy, for your... Uh, for your help. So, what are some of the things, we're going to be halfway through the book today, what are some of the things, some of the key things that we've seen so far, not just last time, but over the last three times when we've looked at this? What are some of the key things you remember that we've seen? Why is the keenest person always sitting at the back? Ah. Um, there's a time for everything. Absolutely right. There's a time for everything. What else? Ah, oh, you see, all the really keen people are sitting at the back today. So, uh, yeah. From last time, be careful what you say. Yeah, be careful what you say. God takes our words really seriously. What else? Ah, oh, some other big themes that we've, uh, we've looked at. Because I've embarrassed you with getting you to talk to each other about something. Um, that we need to have inter 
dependent or interrelationship with each, really with each other so we can draw from each other's strength and weaknesses and that we need to sometimes listen more and be quiet less or something like that. Yeah, listen more and talk less. talk less. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so that we're in, we're interdependent. God didn't made us independent people. He made us interdependent. That we need each other, and we need to uh, listen more and talk less. Yeah, death is certain. Yeah, <laughs> death is certain. It, it's uh, it seems that nobody's mentioned that again. Just uh, a few weeks ago, I, if you weren't here, I got everybody talking to someone else and saying to one another, "I'm going to die." And so are you. Because that's one of the things. We're going to come back to that uh, today. There's, there's something else as well that, that's been a theme through, which um, uh, it's not what happens to us in life that is most significant. It's how we respond to it. Because life throws good stuff and bad stuff, nice stuff and nasty stuff at us. We live in a broken world. And so it just the fact that we are Christians doesn't mean that we're immune from difficult things coming our way. And so all that mix comes our way. And it's not what happens to us. It's how we respond to it, what we do with that, that actually matters most. Okay, we're starting today at chapter 5 and verse 8. And uh, just so you know how we're getting along, we're going to finish when we get to chapter 7 and verse 4. So that's where we're going today. And the overall theme today is about wealth. Who here is wealthy? Okay, put your hands down. Now, in terms of our world, the world in which we live, I think probably, I mean, I don't know the individual per personal circumstances of everybody in the room here. I know quite a few. And I think we are some of the richest people in our world. I don't mean we're the richest people in the UK or the richest people in Greenford, but in our world as a whole, I think we're some of the richest people in our world. So here's the question. Who in this room is wealthy? Yeah, okay. So when we're talking about wealth in here this morning, this isn't about somebody else. This isn't about some multi-millionaire that you happen to know or have read about in some newspaper or celebrity magazine who's got loads and loads and loads and loads of billions of money. This is about wealthy people. So it's also about you and me. And uh, a lot of the material we're looking at this morning is around that. So we start at chapter 5 and verse 8. If you see the poor oppressed in a district and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things. For one official is eyed by a higher one and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields." Come back to that in a moment. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a labourer is sweet, whether he eats little or or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. So this is the start of a section where there are a series of, of cameo pictures and insights. Now the comments in verse 8 and 9 will come as absolutely no surprise to many of you who come from countries where there is much corruption. Each layer of bureaucracy takes a cut. Even the king, today's terms, the president, whoever it is at the top of the pile, even he gets a cut from what's going on in the fields. Everyone takes a cut. And there is huge corruption. And the writer simply observes that this is a normal part of life, human part of life, 
under the sun. Remember, under the sun is the, the signifier that we're excluding God from the picture. And some of what we're going to look at today is under the sun, leaving God out, which is what Ecclesiastes is doing, forcing people to look at life as though there was no God. And some of what we're going to look at today is putting God back in the picture. So we just need to be careful that we've got the right bit at the right time. So there is this image there about corruption. And uh, I could, I'm sure you could tell lots of stories. I could fill the rest of the time this morning with stories um, about uh, corruption in, in some of the countries, some of the places that I've been and seen and heard from firsthand around that whole issue. Verses 10 to 12 list three drawbacks of being wealthy, of being rich. The first of those is that wealth doesn't satisfy. It's like salt water and thirst. You know, you're thirsty, you drink salt water and you get more thirsty, thirstier. Paul, uh, sorry, Timothy uh, writing, uh, sorry, Paul writing to Timothy. I'll get it the right way around in a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 6 uh, often misquoted verse. Let me uh, find it for you. 6 verse 9 and 10. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root. It's not the root as it's often quoted, is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I came across when I was preparing for today two, two quotes about money from two writers on this passage, and uh, I, I like both of these. One is, uh, is Derek Kidner. He wrote this. If anything is worse than the addiction money brings, it is the emptiness it leaves. Man with eternity in his heart. Do you remember we saw that in Ecclesiastes earlier on? That there is something of God that is in us. There is that, all of us, all human beings have something of God in us. We're created with eternity in our heart. And Kidna says, man with eternity in his heart needs better nourishment than this. I like that. I like this one also. This is uh, uh, a guy, Brown, wrote this. Money never delivers what the earner expects from it. Never delivers what the earner expects from it. So the first thing is that money doesn't satisfy. Because on the inside, we've got eternity in our hearts. I've used this phrase previously about but it's having like a, like a God-shaped space on the inside. It's, it's that, that bit of us, that bit of being made in the image of God, that, that bit of eternity inside of us. And, and there's only one thing that fills a God-shaped space, and that is... God. I'm glad you're here, Doug. <laughs> we can try and fill it with other stuff, but it doesn't satisfy. It simply doesn't do it. First drawback, money. Second drawback. Wealth has a habit of attracting hangers-on. You know, you see that in the story of the prodigal son, don't you, in the, uh, in the New Testament. He, he goes off, has lots of money, has lots of friends while he's got lots of money. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any friends. It's a story, but illustrates a truth. Money has a way of attracting lots of hangers-on. I, I think, I may be making this up, but I think I read um, uh, someone who won the lottery recently. Um, I, I, I think in their piece that they, they wrote that I read, it said, I didn't realise until now I had so many friends. <laughs> so if I'm making it up, it's, it's a great quote anyway, but it, it's, I have this memory of reading that. I didn't realise I had so many friends. And thirdly, having lots of money disturbs sleep. For some, it's from worry. 
from others from its indulgence. You know, it, it, is, it is one of the absurdities of modern life that wealthy people seem to spend a lot of money to cope with their wealth. You know, if you see, see a wealthy person, a really wealthy person, um, you know, walking down the street, they're not by themselves. They've got some nice muscle going along with them just to barge people out the way because they're really important. And they have to have a driver to drive their car because they're wealthy, of course. They couldn't possibly drive it themselves. And, and so on and so on. And they've got to have tax consultants and financial advisors and, 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 and. And, of course, because they've got lots of money, they tend to overindulge a bit, so they've got to have extra special medical treatment to, to help them keep their looks and, to, and, and all the rest of it. Kidner again. It's one of our human absurdities to pour out money and effort just to undo the damage of money and ease. In contrast, says the writer... Laborers sleep peacefully. They do their day's work, they have enough, they sleep and they rest. And this goes right against the values of our society here in the UK. Because our society says to us, the more you have, the better you are. The more you possess, which of course you need to show, making sure you've got the latest brand, the latest phone, the latest this, the latest that, that somehow that makes you a better person. That your holiday was in some particularly remote and expensive place. It's how all our advertising works. It's, it's, and it's that value that's there in our society. And it's wrong. It's true. It's untrue. It's a lie at its very base. And here the writer calls it what it is. He challenges that head on and says, this is not true. So he goes on. Verse 13. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner. Or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb. And as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. All this too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs. What does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction and anger. Remember, we're looking at this under the sun. So this is with God out of the picture. Imagining, pretending that God is not there. And the writer looks and sees that the wealthy person didn't really benefit from their wealth. They hoarded it to their own harm. And then suddenly they lost much of it. Some today I was uh, reading an article and they've got this funny phrase which I quite like. This phenomena of, uh, of wealthy people like this, they called it Affluenza. Do you like that? Affluenza. Inflammation of the affluence. Affluenza. Again, Brown. Rich in money are the wealthy, but dead broke in all the ways that matter. Now, you need to hear this carefully and, and correctly. It's not that having wealth is wrong. The writer here doesn't say it's wrong to be wealthy or it's sinful to be wealthy. But God doesn't give us wealth to hoard. That's the issue. He doesn't give it to us for our own self-indulgence. Or to hoard it. Because the fact is, when you die, you can take 
none of it with you. Nothing that's in your hand can you take with you. Because your investment in eternal life, in the bank of heaven, is not stuff that you carry in your hand. What you carry in your hand, you leave here behind. So I want you to think about yourself for a moment. Or people like you, if you don't want to make it too personal. So uh, think about our society, our context here. Remember, we're, we're not about now to start slating off um, you know, people who we think are fantastically rich, multimillionaires, and all of that. Um, as far as I know, we don't have any of those in the congregation this morning. Um, if so, we do need some more money for the building work, by the way. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> What are the warnings that we, we, not they, we, what are the warnings that we should take from these verses about our possessions? Remembering that in global terms, most of us in the room here would be classified as wealthy. Look back through these verses. What are the things that are warnings for us in our society, in our context. I'm not sure I can put this very well, but whatever we have, we hold it lightly because actually it's God's. It's the difference, but I'm going to talk about this in a moment, between holding it in open hand because it's God's and grasping and holding it, and hey, the writer comes to that in a moment. Yeah, very good. What else? Envy over the riches that others have. Well, comparison, oh, he's got a nicer car. I need a car like that. So the danger of that, the danger of that, that envy creeping in, because, because we've seen the advert in the magazine, and we know that the person with that car actually is a bit better. So he's got that car, so I ought to have that car. Phone, brand, clothing, trainers, whatever it happens to be. And it's a lie that's there, and it's a warning about that. Yeah, very good. We're not only um, like wealthy in money and that, like, we're wealthy in the love of Lord. Like, if the, if the Lord had money, he'd spend it on us. But the love of the Lord is all we need. And people uh, nowadays don't realise that and remember that wealth isn't everything. What they have isn't what they need. The Lord is what they need. Brilliant. Very good. What else? Um, it says the, the riches of this world will perish. Whatever we have here in this life will not last for eternity. It's just a, a phase that we're going through and it's better to lay hold on eternal life, which is far more precious than all the wealth of this world. Yeah, and if you think about it logically, if you have the option of accumulating stuff that you're not going to have for more than another 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on how old you are and how old long you think, against stuff that you're going to keep for eternity, uh, I know where it makes sense to put it. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas, again, our society is very much about the instant, about, about the now. Are you just stretching or do you want to say something? Um, sometimes we're not satisfied with what we have. And people, the more money they have, the more they want, um, which... They're grasping it, really, and they want more and more. And sometimes people work themselves to death for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let's move into chapter 6. No, we'll go to verse 18 of chapter 5, actually, because that's um, where we're at. Then I realized that it's good and proper for a man to eat and drink 
and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. And this applies just as much to females as males, as, as most of you will know. We're changing the version that we're going to be using in preaching in September to a gender-inclusive version that doesn't have all these his like this, but recognises that this actually applies equally to uh, everybody. So it's good and proper to find satisfaction, to find enjoyment, and recognising that it's a gift from God. God. This is a view of life, of a life open to God, accepting that all that we have comes from God. Can we say that together? All that we have comes from God. It's important that we recognize that. Because it reminds us that we're stewards. It reminds us that it is God's gift to us. It's not because we happen to be lucky or clever or work ever so ever so hard we don't deserve any of it all of it comes to us from God and when we recognize that we can live like this Philippians 4 and verse 12 I know what it is to be in need I know what it is to have plenty I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So the reality is for us that life is short, but it can be meaningful, it can be enjoyable, it can be satisfying, and a key part of this satisfaction comes from work. But we need to recognise, I said just now, that that all of this comes from God. And as Leslie expressed it earlier on, we need to be holding the stuff that we have with open hands, not grasping it, recognising that actually it all has come as a gift from God. So let me ask you a different question. Looking at these verses, this is looking more now from the perspective of a life that is lived under God. What are the encouragements previously it was about the warnings now what are the encouragements we can take from these verses what are the encouragements I'm glad you're here this morning Doug they, they, they're not a very talkative lot this morning but but, but not being talkative, I don't think it's ever been a problem. That, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's God who grants us satisfaction. And yeah, yeah, he, gives, he gives us enough, and, and he gives us satisfaction in it if we allow him to. Very good. Um, I'm glad you, you're glad you're here as well. Um, it's, you know, no, we needn't feel guilty. Sometimes we can feel guilty you know that we're blessed or um you know the the expression is sort of middle class angst um but to always be you know to be grateful for what we've got but be willing to share yeah, yeah. so part of the encouragement here is that actually it's okay for us to enjoy stuff god gives us stuff to enjoy to find satisfaction and and that is that's good as long as we recognize that he's giving it that to us I see that hand. I see several hands, but all the way to the back, first of all. I mean, what's encouraging is that as a body of people in, in Jesus, we are wealthy for each other to uh, share and give where needed. Great. Thank you. Um, what I take from it is like God, like, even though God gives you enough, he gives you a bit more than what you need and like that gives you the encouragement to give back to the poor to everybody else and like to not go overboard on it like don't spend it on what you don't need very good 
excuse me, I'll try not to tread on your toes. Uh, that we should recognize that everything we have is a gift from God. Mm-hmm. And um, we should be wise with it as well. So in terms of sharing and remembering that, not grasping and being too greedy or, and all that. So. Very good. The reason God blesses us so that we can bless others, not to hold for ourselves. Very good. Very good. Now we're really going to move into chapter 6. I've seen another evil under the sun. So we're back again under the sun. God written out the picture. And it weighs heavily on men. God gives a man wealth, possessions and honour so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place. This is a very graphic, uh, very graphic picture that the writer Uh, paints here, looking at someone who does not recognize that what they have comes from God. They've got all they need in material terms, but but no satisfaction, no sense of fulfillment, and they're going to die in this state. And the writer ponders in this this graphic uh, picture here whether it would be better if they had never lived at all. He suggests that long life without enjoyment, is worse than no life at all. That's very graphic, isn't it? A long life, 2,000 years, 100 children, but without enjoyment from God, be better off if he'd never been born. And again, that goes right against a lot of our cultural values. He then writes about a stranger enjoying instead of the man his goods, his wealth. In the author's day, as is in the case today for so many in our world, life is in reality unpredictable. You've only got to look at the, some of the stories in the news in this last week. People who were settled in their homes, settled in communities with, with jobs and with provisions and with a good life. And suddenly, in a moment, the refugees... Or some other disaster strikes. What we grasp, what people grasp in their hands, can so easily slip between our fingers. What we try and grasp and hold on to. Now the story uh, that Jesus told of, of the man who was very wealthy, and he had so much, couldn't keep it in one barn. So he built another barn to store it in. Then he died. Again, it's that remembering that that we don't hold this stuff for ourselves. We hold it for God. Verse 7 of chapter 6. All man's efforts are for his mouth. Yet his appetite 
appetite is never satisfied. What advantage is a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named. What man is has been known. No man can contend with one who is stronger than he. The more the words, the less the meaning. And, and how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a man in life? During the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? Series of, of observations here, all with the same theme. Noting that without God, there is nothing that really leads to contentment. And there is nothing that we have the power to say or to do to change that. If we leave God out of the picture, these images about how life is are true for us as they're true for anybody else who lives in this way. So, the last but one question this morning. As we look back at this chapter, chapter 6, which is really about possessions and inheritance, what are the, what are the challenges in these observations for us this morning. Um, for me, it's um, whatever it is we've got, which is a gift from God, of course, whether little or much, that we should thank God for it but be thankful and also let crave God's contentment. God's contentment should be above it all. Thank you. Anybody else? Hmm. Um, how do we pray and how do we share our wealth? Do you want to add another sentence to that? Or just leave that as a question in the air? Yeah, as a question. <laughs> okay. I was thinking of um, people who have got lots of money and then leaving it for their descendants or other people. I think it's good that people have to provide for them, but um, don't hoard it all. Use it wisely now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying two things there, I think, if I can correct you. One is that um, we shouldn't just be storing the stuff up, yeah. but actually we should be using what we've got. And we've seen some good examples of that in some of the world's wealthiest people creating uh, trusts where they're helping people in some of the poorest parts of the world. Um, but you're also, I think, suggesting that in people's wills and in what they do, they need to be thinking about how to use what God has given them, not just necessarily for their immediate descendants, but actually for others in our, in our, in our world. Yeah. Um, just to invert, really, but the scripture says, you know, if you sell everything you have and give it to the poor, that, that's not any prof that doesn't profit you. And it doesn't earn you any brownie points with with God. Um, so it's you know when 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 we see God, he he's he's not going to ask us. Um, he's not going to ask us really what we did with the money. It's the, the eternal eternal thing. So not to focus on money. It's what we did with with everything we have, not just money. You know our lives are our lives basically and everything that we have. 
not just money. Yeah. I, I used to... I used to bank, I've just changed my bank recently. I'm not going to tell you why I changed, who I changed it from or to. But the bank I used to bank with used to have this thing at the top of the page when you logged into your account. This is how much you are worth today. <laughs> that wasn't why I changed from that particular bank, but it always struck me as being completely untrue. Yeah. me it would be to remember like not to worry about life just to live it as it is even though we have like like money there it's not everything like to remember that uh, the lord's given it to you for a certain reason and not to go like overboard because money isn't everything very good very good okay let's move into uh, into chapter 7 and um so this is going to get a bit uncomfortable now, all right? So you're ready to get... I mean, you might have been uncomfortable so far, of course, but these next few verses are about as countercultural as you can get in our, certainly our, our British culture as it is currently. A good name is better than fine perfume. Amen to that? Amen. And the day of death is better than the day of birth. Amen to that? Really? Uh, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man and woman. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. Because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. The last time I spoke here on this passage was my first Sunday back at work in 2004 after my father had died and I chose this passage to talk about uh, beginning in fact at the start of chapter chapter 7 it's a commonly observed fact that facing your own near death so if you've had an experience where you have nearly died maybe in a, an accident or maybe in an illness or uh, some other context or situation, or if you're facing or have faced the death of someone near to you, it, it can, doesn't necessarily, but it can change your whole approach to life. Because it punctures a myth that our society here in the UK holds, and that is, you're not going to die. And the writer's back to this again here, and, it, and he's back to it again because it's a really important thing. He's, as he says here, death is the destiny of every person. And our society here pretends, tries to pretend, this is not really true. Partying is more popular than mourning. But it's looking at the reality of our own death in the face that leads to wisdom because it puts life into context. To quote Brown for the last time this morning, death orientates the self towards authentic rather than false living. Let me tell you something about myself and then opportunity for you to respond to this. I, I have a mentor. I've had a, a mentor for the last couple of years now. Um, he conveniently lives in Australia. But that's another story. Um, 
At a session uh, with him, the, not the last session, the one before last, he said to me, I want to give you something to do. Well, he normally says that to me and gives me things to do. He said, I want you to imagine that you're at your own funeral. Uh, okay. I, I want you to imagine you're at your own funeral, and I, and I want you to think about what you would like people to be saying about you at your funeral. Think about the significant people in your life and think about what you would like them to be saying about you at your funeral. I have to say, when he asked me to do that, I thought that is a very strange thing to do. Um, in fact, the first time he asked me to do it, I didn't do it. But when he came back to it the second time, I thought, okay, all right, I'll get on with this. Because, the, the, you know, in practice, a person's reputation isn't established until after their death. It's all provisional until then. So I, I did this exercise, and uh, I, I imagined, and I thought about all the people who were most significant to me. Um, some of them were groups of people like friends, uh, fellow church leaders, family, and so on. Um, I'm not going to tell you the details, any of the details at all, but I went through that, and I wrote down what I thought I'd like these people to be saying about me. And, uh, and then the next part of this exercise was to think about my life now, between now and then. In, in fact, he suggested thinking for me for the next 10 years. And, and I know it's not, it is, of course, a huge assumption that I'm going to live for another 10 years. I may do, I may not. Life is not predictable, as we all know. But thinking about that and thinking, what do I need to do in my life? What do I need to work at for those things that I want people to say about me to be true? What do I, what do I need to do? How does my life need to be different? And then coming out of that, uh, I, with him and also working with, with Leslie, my wife, who's here this morning, put together, and she's done the same exercise, by the way, putting together um, some objectives and priorities for this year and for the next few years. I'm going to review those every six months together as we look at that. Because when you think about and face the fact that actually you're going to die, it does put into context life. You know, as human beings, we are amazingly good at putting off to tomorrow what we ought to be doing today. I'm a list writer. I, I list of things to do. I, I'm, a, I'm a list writer. Um, I, I, don't, I know some of these people do like these mind map things. Some of my students, um, when they're planning essays, they do, they do these mind map things. I can't get my head around them at all. I'm a list writer. And it's very easy to, to, you know, you're working down your list, think, oh, well, actually, no, that can wait. And then it can wait. And before long, you realise that actually it's been waiting for three months, oh, six months, uh, a year, and you haven't got around to doing it. But when you begin to focus on the fact that actually you have a limited time that God has put you here for, Uh, it does focus you on how you want things to be. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that all of you should go away now and imagine your own funeral and imagine what people would like to say and, and all of that. I'm not, I'm not saying that that is a requirement for you. I'm just illustrating how actually spending some time looking at the day of death can give a lot more insight than looking at the day of birth. How spending time in houses of mourning give a lot of understanding about life. As it says in verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. So, as you look at these four verses, and this is where we're going to end this morning, as we look at these four verses, is there anything that comes for you as you 
reflect on your own context and situation, how these things apply to us in our culture and in our lives. Anything you'd like to share with us? I think one of the things that we lose in our culture um, makes it very hard to get to grips with this because it says it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of pleasure. But how we deal with mourning in 21st century Britain is very different to how this was written. And the house of mourning is a place where you go to give out to the people in mourning. The house of pleasure is a place where you go to have fun for yourself and is very, very self-centered. And there's a, there's a position here of saying, it's not wrong to have fun and enjoy yourself, but it's about where your heart is. Is your heart going out to the other people or just for yourself? In, in your, can I ask you a question? Is that right? In, in, your, in your mind when you're saying this, uh, you're, I think you're thinking about a particular um, Jewish uh, right that, that goes, along with, goes along with death, which most people here wouldn't be familiar with at all. Could, could you, would you mind just taking a few sentences to explain that? For some people here within their own cultures, they would actually have things that are quite similar, um, but others would not. So is that okay? Yes, except that I've never actually witnessed it firsthand, only from what my family have talked about. And that is the case that the person in mourning sits on a stool in a room and people go to them. They go to their house. They, they are there for them. Um, it's a community event. Um, I guess some cultures, not so distant from here, do still have it because the Irish, for example, have the wake where you do have that real sense of community and it's less individual. Thank you. Anybody else? I think that in a house of mourning you have a change of perspective. When you face death, when you're looking at it, then all of a sudden, a lot of things that seemed important, their importance changes. Um, they become almost irrelevant. And you focus on the things that, for you, really matter. Um, in my life, it was some things that God, about God, that had not been in the forefront. And um, I think it's that close contact with death that makes everything shift. I don't know how to explain it better than that. And Leslie's talking about sitting Shiva, and, um, and we still do it, um, not on a stool. We, we sit on the couch. But with my family, with the death of every member of my family, we sit Shiva, and it's... A great comfort. In South Asian culture, it, it, this is again, as Leslie said, it's a community event. So um, Christians go to the house of the morning and they take food, they prepare food because they are not able to cook or they are in great mourning, they won't bother to cook. So we take food to that house and uh, somebody will share the word of God and ask them if there is anything else we can do for that family. So it's, yeah, it is a community thing. And yeah, so people sing comforting songs and uh, share from the Bible to comfort them. Great, thank you. Our time is almost gone this morning. Uh, key things to take away from this, uh, this passage, there are three things that it seems to me are the key things to take away. 
going back to the beginning, the first thing is that, that wealth doesn't satisfy. It's not wrong, it's not evil, but it doesn't satisfy. Second thing is the recognition that all we have came to us from God. Everything we have came to us from God. And thirdly, facing the reality of our own death can help us to live more authentic and meaningful and focused lives. Let's stand together if you're able to. I'm going to give you a few moments of silence and you can make your own response to God. And then in a minute or two, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Father God, Jesus came that we can have life and live it in its fullness. Father God, thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for all the blessings that we have in life. So much that we have received for us in the room here, for others who are watching. So much we have received from you. Materially, relationally, just everything that we have has come from you. Father God, thank you. Father, help us to live lives recognizing how short life actually is <laughs> and using the things that you have given to us to help, to bless, to encourage, to strengthen others around us. Help us to invest our time and our resources wisely, appropriately. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please sit down. I told you those last few minutes were going to be uncomfortable, didn't I? There you go. But you don't come here for Bible teaching to tickle your ears. You come here because you want to engage with the things that really matter with the truth. So it's time to collect your children from Kresh and Sunday Club. And uh, God bless you and have a really blessed week this week. God bless you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.